sky guys it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous and I do mean over the top beautiful postcard perfect day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here at Bugs in a Jar Farm on this absolutely beautiful it is a Saturday it is July 30th 2022 and a little dog and I have to take a break from cleaning the silt out of my dried up bog garden here as the New York drought takes over. So you know Saturday, you know once again I was going to attempt to do a hopium roundup rant but I, you know guys I don't know am I the only one who is in many ways more depressed by the hopium and the apocaloptimism and the techno utopianism and all of this unadulterated horseshit that we're going to turn this uh, freight train around at this point. It just, it, it truly, uh, it, it, it really is as depressing as what's going on on the planet. So since I'm not doing that, well, then uh, I decided I was going to make this my Sunday Doomsday Sermon for tomorrow where we're going to hear probably for the first time ever at Collapse Chronicles, we're going to hear from that little lefty Tom Hartman. Tom Hartman, I used to have a lot of respect for Tom Hartman. Um, read and listened to him quite a bit, but it was two years ago, I guess, when he... He, you know, drank the uh, Corona Panic Kool-Aid. Last time I listened to one word Tom Hartman said about anything, he was using the term Trump, Trump tard or Trump supporter or whatever interchangeably with people uh, who did not wear masks. That if you did not wear a mask, you were a Donald Trump supporter. And if you did wear them, you know what I'm saying? And when I hear something that clueless, that completely absurd, coming out of some clueless moron, little lefty mouth, that's it. So I have not heard from Tom Hartman, but I am very glad to hear that Tom, uh, Maybe because he can breathe again and get some oxygen to his brain. <clears throat> is uh, this is from his own website, I guess, but it's showing up in common dreams. A couple of you have sent this to me, so this was going to be my Sunday sermon, but since I don't have the stomach for the apocaloptimism uh, around, uh, we're just going to go with this. And I do want to say, I don't know how long this essay is going to go. The f most of the first half of it, shockingly enough, is about the overkill hypothesis. And anyway, so uh, can't get off on that noble savage, uh, the myth of the noble savage. But uh, thank you, Tom Hartman. So a lot of it is going to be Tom Hartman talking intelligently about the myth of the noble savage. But if you just want to skip over that, then he ties the myth of the noble savage into the myth of you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. And the second half, but I'm just going to sit here and read the whole thing while we have planet nibbling going on in the background. Okay, Tom Hartman, for the probably the first time ever on Collapse Chronicles, explained this to us, <clears throat> how the corporate oligarchs have put humanity on a path toward self-annihilation. We are stumbling, seemingly oblivious, into the bared teeth of the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch driven by humanity itself. We are walking straight into it and pretending it is not here. Okay, and again, I'm going to put the link to this long 
Um, essay, you're welcome uh, to go over there, shut me up and read it yourself, but if you just want to sit around and listen to me read this while I rest my aching back, I'll be happy to do that. Okay, Tom, what's on your mind today? <clears throat> the world today is on the verge of a major food emergency provoked in part by Russia's attack on Ukraine but more broadly by the damage heat from global warming is doing to crops worldwide. This is both a crisis and an opportunity. Well, maybe we do have some hopium. Uh, we're going to mix up a little hopium uh, in here. Let's start with the basics. Food. Food <coughs> is the raw material that makes people more food, more people less food, fewer people. This is a basic law of nature. The insect eating bird population around us, for example, is a fraction today of what it was 20 years ago because its food, the insect population, has been decimated by pesticides and loss of habitat, their food source, over the last few, de last few decades. Pick any species and the law of nature is the same. More food produces population growth, while less food shrinks population, often in brutal ways. It is why areas like desert and scrub that produce little food were, over the past millennia, lightly populated whereas areas rich with food like forest and seacoast carry large human populations. Well, I guess not counting the Amazon rainforest. Anyway, throughout our lifetimes and the past four centuries, human population has steadily grown because we had not yet hit the new ceilings the agricultural and industrial revolutions gave us to produce and distribute food. However, this halcyon era is coming to an end because of the climate crisis provoked by 60 years of senior executives in the fossil fuel industry lying to us and buying off politicians while making trillions pouring their poisons into our atmosphere. This should not shock us when it happens all around us and millions are starving and homeless, although it almost certainly will because most of the human race has lived for so long within the food abundance created by the widespread use of fossil fuels starting in the 19th century. Humans reaching the limits of food's ability to sustain population is not a new story. It's as old as humanity itself. And now we're going to take a trip down to New Zealand to hear about those noble savages called the Maori. Okay, this is for those people who do not, you know, those clueless morons who do not believe that primitive humans were able to pretty much uh, destroy every one of their fellow earthlings using clubs and bow and arrows. And you cannot blame climate change on what happened in New Zealand 1,500 years ago. Climate change had nothing to do with it. So... Uh, anyway, I do, I do appreciate Tom going off on this uh, little bit uh, of a rabbit chase here, but he'll come back to the bigger story. But I'm going, since uh, I am a big proponent of the overkill hypothesis, I'm going to go ahead and read this part out. All right. As I wrote in as I wrote in Threshold the crisis of western culture 
800 years ago, a group of Melanesians sailed to the islands they called Aotearoa, and we now call New Zealand. When they first arrived around the year 80, 1200s, humans had never before inhabited that island paradise. Food was everywhere for the taking, particularly a large flightless family of birds called the moa, similar to ostriches. There were so many of the birds, and they were so easily approached that the archaeological record shows that during the first few hundred years of occupation, you know, by humans for the first time ever in history, the islanders did not even need weapons. No bows and arrows, no spears, no specialized weapons of any sort can be found in the archaeological record from those early times. The birds and many other large animals were so docile that people simply walked up and clubbed them to death with a stick or just broke their necks. A dozen different species of New Zealand moa birds from weighing from under 50 to over 500 pounds each provided meat and eggs well in excess of the food needs of the initial Melanesian explorers. This abundance of food led to a golden age of peaceful human population expansion on New Zealand. The few dozen initial settlers became hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands, all feasting on the huge moa birds. As their population grew, the Maori killed the moa in huge numbers. In the Otago district, in the, oh, all right, in the Otago district, an ancient killing field was found at Waitaki containing more than 90,000 moa skeletons. The bones suggest that the birds were clubbed or their necks were wrung. While this is the largest Moa boneyard, several other similar ancient sites have been discovered around New Zealand in the past few decades. As many as a million Moa birds, representing hundreds of millions of pounds of meat, were killed by the early settlers now known as the Ma Maori people take a wild guess what Maori means moa eating yes the moa eating people so whenever you hear the word Maori just say moa eating <clears throat> the moa eating people population grew and over the next three years Moa eating people spread all across the 103,000 square miles of New Zealand. They lived in peace and harmony, convinced that the gods had intentionally brought them to this island and thus showed them, thus showered them with its blessing of a seemingly unlimited supply of food. But as inevitably happens to cultures who think they can defy nature, the times of Moa for the Moa eating people came to an end. Their Moa feast lasted for three to four hundred years but came to an abrupt end with the death of the last Moa bird and thus the final and total extinction of all twelve Moa species. The islanders then began eating other local animals. In short order, they exterminated or brought to the brink of extinction the hula, the takahe, and the kakapo. All birds ranging from the size of modern chickens down to the size of pigeons along the coast, the moa eating people, now I guess I had to change their name, the Maori 
hunted the three ton elephant seal to extinction within the first 400 years, exterminated the half ton sea lion, and from all but the most remote regions, wiped out the 300 pound New Zealand fur seal. Turning to fish, the Maori soon endangered even the ubiquitous snappers as the archaeological record shows the fish skeletons and the hooks used to catch them declined in size rapidly over a hundred year period following the extinction of the moa. <clears throat> the easily killed large animals all exterminated the Maori turned to what were considered famine foods by their seafaring ancestors. Roots, tubers, frogs, ferns, rats, and small birds. Along with this change in their diet came a dramatic shift in Maori culture. Around AD 14, Roughly 400 years after their initial colonization of New Zealand, the Maori people began building fortresses and constructing tools for organized warfare. The forts, called paws in the Maori language, proliferated across the island. <clears throat> the, primar the primary cultural values of Maori society shifted from cooperation to fighting and killing other humans for the scarce, the scarce resources left on the island. The arts of war became elaborate and each community spent enormous time and effort making their pa an impenetrable fortress. Shortly after birth, Maori bo boys were dedicated to the god of war. Over the next 200 years, the Maori's war-bent culture achieved an uneasy stability. They had moved from population explosion in the face of huge food resources to near famine conditions, then to farming sweet potatoes in the lowland valleys and building forts for standing armies. Dutch explorer Abel Tasman was the first European to reach New Zealand and encounter the Maori people just weeks after he had mapped nearby Tasmania. On December 16, 1642, he wrote in his journal about his one and only encounter with the Maori. He sent a small group of his men out in a cock boat, a cock boat to meet the natives Without warning, the Maori attacked Tasman sailors as soon as the boat was close to their canoes. Quote, in which fray three of the Zihan's men were left dead and a fourth owing to the heavy blows mortally wounded, the quartermaster and two sailors swam toward our ship and we sent our shallop to meet them into which they got alive. After this monstrous happening and detestable affair, the murderers left the cockboat adrift, having taken one of our dead in their canoe and drowned another." Close quote. What Tasman discovered was that among the Maori, protein was in such short supply that they had passed the last human cultural barrier to a new food source, cannib cannibalism. Tasman watched helplessly as his one crewman, taken alive by the Maori, was beheaded on the beach. The Maori recovered the bodies of the others and roasted them. Horrified, Tasman named the cove Murderer's Bay and sailed away, never to return. This story of humans wiping out the resources that sustain them has been repeated over and over again throughout human prehistory. It is far more 
the norm than the exception. For the first few hundred thousand years of our history, more or less, modern humanity worldwide was limited to an estimated five million or so humans. As Daniel Quinn would say, we quote, lived in the hands of the gods, repeatedly booming and busting our own local populations as we spread to new territories, discovered new food supplies, and then depleted them. Here in North America, the arrival of humanity around 15,000 years ago coincided, coincided with a mass die-off of large, easily killed food animals. What a coincidence. This is just an amazing coincidence. Humans arrive, all the big, uh, easy to kill, uh, clueless animals die. All right, so this is what happened here. And uh, now the good old US of A. What did the first Asian invasives the first Asian invaders, you know, these Native Americans, which are an invasive species from Asia. I read this interesting story in the mainstream media. They're now thinking that Native Americans actually came from China. <laughs> you know, talk about history repeating itself, that, uh, that they're finding a lot of this... Uh, hilariously named Native American uh, genes uh, in China. Anyway, so what did the first Asian, Chinese, whatever they were, uh, invasive species of humans uh, accomplish uh, when they got here? How about exterminating off the face of this planet woolly mammoths, Colombian mammoths, American mastodons, three types of ground sloths, glyptodonts, giant armadillos, several species of horses, four species of pronghorn antelopes. I would have to, uh, ha, anyway, I'm going to put a asterisk by four species of pronghorn antelopes, three species of camels, giant deer, several species of oxen and giant bison. What, what people do not realize, again, is that there really was a Native American species of bison, which made these little invaders that came over with humans, okay, these little midget bison, that they that we're always talking about they are not native americans any more than uh these asian invaders those bison came over here at the same time humans did and promptly the native american bison went extinct and I could go off on a whole nother rant about that, but uh, we, ha we have to move on. Um, all right. Scientists are still debating whether changes in climate or the human overhunting Pleistocene overkill was most responsible for the extinction of so many animals in such a short period. Odds are it was both, as this was toward the tail end of the Ice Age and the climate was rapidly changing. And uh, it was actually, that's not quite right, Tom. But uh, of course, the climate uh, thing uh, in no way, shape, or form explains what happened in New Zealand. It doesn't, have, it doesn't explain that all of these megafaunal extinctions 
uh, were taking place right down to the southern tip of Florida. It doesn't explain, you know, all of the Latin American uh, megafauna that went extinct at the same time. It doesn't explain the Madagascar uh, megafauna extinction. Uh, anyway, I'm debating my ass. As David J. Meltzer chronicles in his brilliant new book, First People in a New World Populating Ice Age America, multiple DNA-identified groups of humans moved across North and South America over the following 10,000 years. Many of them simply vanished, their DNA gone forever, leaving not a single descendant to this day. This boom and bust cycle has been the story of humanity since the first modern humans began migrating out of East Africa across that continent, up through the Middle East into Europe and Asia, and across the frozen, the then frozen Barents Strait to the Americas. Periodic famine has been the norm for humanity throughout most of our history. We find new lands or new resources, exploit them mercilessly until they are exhausted, then fall back into famine and war until a new homeostatic culture and lifestyle is achieved. It is the most logical explanation, some anthropologists argue, for why Native American, otherwise known as Asian invasive societies, placed such a high premium reported in the era of first contact with Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries on sustainability. Their ancestors had wiped out the local food supplies, producing famine, intertribal conflict, and war. Most of the subsequently rebuilt cultures and systems of governance were intentionally designed to prevent a repeat of those traumatic experiences. The most well-known of, of those is the Iroquois Confederacy that Benjamin Franklin so admired, which brings us to today. So we're going to draw some dots between the Moa-eating noble savages of New Zealand to modern-day America and the rest of the world, which brings us to today. While the agricultural revolution increased the world's population because farming is so much more efficient at producing food than hunting and gathering or even pastoralism, we had, we had still only reached a bit over a half billion people worldwide when Europeans first arrived in North America. Can you say the former Georgia Guidestones maintained a global population of 500 million, where more or less is where we were when Europeans first arrived in North America the subsequent industrial revolution, powered by fossil fuels created by hundreds of millions of years of photosynthesis, fossil fuels are simply fossilized plants, dramatically ramped up our ability to grow and transport food. Thus, we hit 1 billion people in 1800, 2 billion in 1930, 3 billion in 1960, 4 billion in 1974, 5 billion in 1986, 6 billion by the turn of the century, and today we're on the verge of 8 billion people. Well, I think we passed that long ago, but who knows. Fossil fuels were turned into fertilizers pesticides and herbicides to grow more food on the same amount of land. 
they power our planting and harvesting machines, allowing one single person to do a job that previously would have required hundreds of people, each driving a horse or ox. In 1820, for example, 72% of the American workforce were farmers. By 1850, because of the cotton gin and new planting technology, plowing technologies, that number fell to 64% of the American workforce. In 1920, as gasoline and diesel-powered internal combustion engines began showing up on farms, only 30% of us worked on farms. Today, farmers are fewer than 2% of us here in the U.S. And like the MOA birds, the era of cheap fossil fuels and a stable climate that enabled 2% of us to feed the other 90% is drawing to a close. Fossil fuels are getting harder to find and more expensive to produce. Again, I'm not getting into a debate with Tom on that one. Okay. Uh, while, according to Tom Hartman, while fossil fuels are getting harder to find and more expensive to produce, while climate change is reducing crop yields, melting glaciers that are the source of irrigating rivers and drying up above ground reservoirs. We are stumbling seemingly oblivious into the bared teeth of the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch driven by humanity itself. We are walking straight into it and pretending it is not here, and it is changing how we live, how we govern ourselves, and the nature of relations between nations. Already hundreds of millions of people have become climate refugees, and radical weather is destabilizing governments around the world. The Arab Spring, for example, started because the desert across north of Tunisia and Syria had moved south and wheat farms were turned into scrubland, causing the price of that staple food to explode. A Tunisian falafel street vendor lit himself on fire in protest, triggering uprisings across the region. The Arab Spring and its subsequent democratic collapse in Egypt and now Tunisia are harbingers of things to come in other parts of the world. The growth of a food supply parallels the growth of a population. It is one of the few laws of nature that has always applied to humans even though we ignore it or pretend it does not exist. The agricultural and industrial revolutions, by increasing the available food supply, exploded the world's human population. Over the last 200 years, advances in medical science and hygiene have additionally reduced the death rate while a whole variety of technologies have increased our food output. But, like the Maori, we are approaching the end of the free ride. Food, energy, and housing are starting to get very expensive. Most of the world has already leaped into this maelstrom this isn't run-of-the-mill inflation. It is what happens to an economy when a basic commodity, in this case, the most basic commodity, food, becomes scarce. The entire GOP refuses to even discuss climate change 
while they and Joe Munchkin stuffed their pockets with fossil fuel money. Now, this came out the day that, uh, you know, two days ago, right when Munchkin uh, finally signed off on that deal. I need to do a whole rant on that bullshit that went down uh, between Munchkin and Schumer uh, the day that Tom Hartman was putting this out. Uh, uh, unbelievable. That's another rant for another day. I get so sick uh, 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 of these politicians. Meanwhile, the end stage crisis that has been building ever since the fossil fuel companies learned this was coming and started aggressively lying to us about it while funding the Reagan revolution has arrived. What happened to the Maori or Native American communities who overhunted 10,000 years ago was local. This is now planet wide. There is no place left to go and start over. If you thought it was a disgusting spectacle to see the Bundy family stealing federal lands and water at gunpoint, you ain't seen nothing yet. Water wars between states and regions are just around the corner, and soon large parts of America will begin to lose population as their water supplies vanish. Will we, like the ancient Maori, devolve into an authoritarian and war-based society? Well, Tom, I hate to tell you, brother, but we devolved into an authoritarian and war-based society, I think, in about 1776. Anyway, or will we like the Iroquois, Hopi, and Wendat people and those other noble savages make a conscious decision to live within our means, stop destroying our environment, and fine-tune our governmental systems to meet the needs of all our citizens. We are not without resources, and it is always a mistake to bet against human ingenuity. On the other hand, we are facing an unprecedented level of avarice motive mobilized by billionaires and corporations with more power, power and wealth than the world has ever seen. Will they win and in the process set human civilization back millennia? Or will humanity prevail over the forces of greed and destruction and help salvage our biosphere while reinventing our culture and world? Take a wild guess, uh, Tom. You know where the smart man is. The hour is late, but scientists tell us. You know those scientists who told us that anyone who does not uh, wear a mask voted for Donald Trump. Those scientists, I guess. The hour is late, scientists tell us, but not too late. Our fate and that of the planet is still in our hands. Yes. All right. Thank you, Tom Hartman. Uh, only a little bit of that hopium at the end, but anyway, I have to. All this talk about eating moa birds is getting me hungry, and I. Little dog and I have to go find some factory farmed moa bird to eat while we still can. I highly suggest you get out there and eat a moa while you still can. Man, look at this gorgeous day. Bye, guys.